Thank you, Andres. Well, it's a delight to uh, be here this evening. And, and uh, although I just am in Oslo for 24 hours, I want to welcome you to this evening at least. And I'm very, very touched by the turnout. Uh, I see some old friends who I've met either in the United States or elsewhere and, and some new friends who I met last night. And uh, it's just very touching for me to be here. And my wife, Myla, is also here. And um, uh, I was here 10 years ago and absolutely, you know, just love this country. And, and I want to apologize right off the bat for not being able to speak to you in Norwegian. So I thank you for your willingness to uh, listen to me in English. And I hope that it's clear enough. Um, every language has its own peculiarities. and. Uh, and, and language is intimately related to how we express things that are very, very difficult to express. I also want to welcome the little one who's in the room. Where is the little one in the room? Very sweet, yeah. So this is the most important person in the room. And everything that he has to say, or not say, it's a he, right? Yeah, yeah uh, is very important and doesn't, isn't an interruption, you know. It's just part of life expressing itself. And so welcome in particular to the two of you. And, um, and I want to just honor my relationship with Andres. We go back, as you heard, a long way. Yes, and is it possible to uh, have the doors such that people can come and go? I mean, especially come. Uh, <laughs> without someone having to get up every time to let them in. That would be nice, and, you know, and if that's possible. So uh, to just say that the reason that I am here in, uh, in Oslo really has to do with supporting people who have uh, interest in mindfulness, and in particular the people who are uh, doing the work of mindfulness-based stress reduction, MBSR, here. And there's a growing number of people who are doing it. Put the, raise the book up so that it still holds the, that's it, that's it. It's an exercise in mindfulness. Yeah, welcome. Yeah. You want to give the talk? Yeah, you're welcome to. So, um, and I want to thank Erwin uh, Annenberg for being, uh, you know, willing to publish books on mindfulness in Norwegian, and, and I really uh, thank you for the relationship. So let's take a moment and just reflect. Uh, this is uh, Wednesday, right? Wednesday, at the end of probably a long day for most of you. And here you are, uh, and you've come to a talk on mindfulness. So I'd like you to reflect for a moment why you're here. I mean, you could be eating, you could be doing any number of other things, and yet you've devoted some time to a talk on on mindfulness. So maybe take a moment and just ask yourself well, why you're here. And just let that sink in for a moment, whatever comes. And if you don't know why you're here, that's fine too. That's a very advanced answer. <laughs> And then whatever that answer is that arose for you, now ask yourself the following question. Why am I really here? And just reflect a little bit about that. And then just let that settle. 
and ask yourself the next question. Why am I really, really here? Because it's my experience that nobody comes to a talk on mindfulness by accident. You just sort of stumbled in off the street. Oh, somebody talking about mindfulness. Uh, and our motivation for even being interested in this kind of thing is, is in itself very interesting. Um, and whatever came up for you when you asked yourself those three questions, just let that resonate inside for the rest of the evening. Uh, because um, whatever it is that it has brought you here, for me there's an, always an element of mystery to it that there may be a sense that uh, um, I'm sure you didn't come just to look at my face, you know. Uh, uh, there must be some kind of interior reason that doesn't just have to do with curiosity. Although curiosity about mindfulness would be fine. But underneath the curiosity, there must be some kind of reason for that interest. And I'm interested in that. Uh, we won't go into it tonight. Mostly tonight I'm going to just be talking about the work that we've been doing for the past 32 years now at the University of Massachusetts Medical Center. Uh, and, that it, and it's a work that we call Mindfulness-Based Stress Reduction. And I saw that the title of this talk has something to do with like ancient wisdom for modern stress and stress reduction. And whenever we play the ancient wisdom violin, you know, everybody goes, oh, yes, that's what we need is some ancient wisdom. Uh, from the East, preferably, you know, uh, ancient <laughs> wisdom. That's really important because we don't know enough in the West and we need to sort of go to the magical East for answers or some special technique or whatever. And uh, it's really much more interesting than that, mindfulness. This is sort of, if there's any ancient wisdom, it, it, it's, it lies inside our DNA, all of us, wherever we happen to inhabit the planet. And if there's any ancient wisdom, it lies inside our hearts. And it's something that, in a sense, we may already know, that we don't know that we know, or that we may be yearning for, longing for, uh, that may help us feel more in touch, or more complete, or more whole. And from the outside, we can look completely whole, completely well, completely healthy, completely at peace. But inwardly, a lot of the time, it may feel as if there's something missing. And even if Andres called this the wealthiest country in the world. I didn't know that until yesterday. But even, say, in the wealthiest country in the world, there may be little things that, or something, whatever it is, sometimes enormous things, but that actually threaten our sense of well-being and our sense of being comfortable in our own skin and in our own lives, being who we are. Now, in America, everybody wants to be somebody else. They don't want to be who they are. It's a celebrity, intoxicated culture, and we're always interested in other people and how they're living, and we actually ignore or disregard the only dimension of our being that we could have any kind of wise relationship to. So if we're always interested in out there, somebody else knows or has the answer or the answer to life or whatever it is, even if it's somebody dressed up in robes with a shaved head that comes from the East. Uh, in a sense, it's a certain way in which we're disregarding our own wholeness. And the beauty of wholeness, which is the root meaning of the word health, healthy, uh, healing, and holy, H-O-L-Y, is this sense that we may already be integrated, we may already be whole, 
and we're ignoring or disregarding something really fundamental. So the wisdom is not in the East, and it's not in the Dalai Lama, and it's not in this master or that master. The wisdom is actually inside of us to begin with. And the science is actually showing that now, that uh, in the past 10 or 15 years, from the scientific point of view, we've begun to realize that the brain is an organ of interfacing with experience. And it is continually reshaping itself on the basis of our experiences. Not just reshaping its firing patterns, but actually rebuilding its architecture. Changing relative size and thickness of different regions in uh, the neocortex and in the limbic system and in all the sorts of extremely important areas for us to actually live our lives effectively, to make decisions, to remember anything, to um, learn anything. And so from that point of view, we're a miraculous being. The science is also showing it's not just the brain that's plastic. They call this neuroplasticity, the ability of the brain to reshape itself on the basis of experience. But it turns out the chromosomes are also continually doing this. It used to be thought that when you're born, you get a certain uh, inheritance, and that's your fate. You know, whatever the genes are that you got, that's your fate. And that is true to a degree, but now there's another science called the science of epigenetics. And what that's saying is, yes, we do inherit the chromosomes from our mothers and fathers in a you know, random sort of fashion, but how those chromosomes get expressed, how the genes on those chromosomes get expressed, that is influenced by how you eat, by how you deal with stress, by all sorts of other things. So that means, that's very good news, because it means that not only is the brain plastic, but also our metabolic uh, well-being is, is, is changeable on the basis of how we decide to be in relationship to our lives. Exercise, diet, uh, and regulating stress. Learning, how to, learning something about tuning the mind. Cultivating intimacy with our own minds. Woody Allen is famous for saying, I, don't, I relate to my mind the way I relate to uh, a, dark, um, a dark street in the inner city. I try never to go there alone. <laughs> it's scary territory. So actually, we're not educated to actually befriend our own minds. And we don't pay that much attention to our minds, or our bodies for that matter. And again, as I was suggesting, we also don't appreciate the full complement of it. One other thing in terms of the science, and that is that there's another very interesting new development in science. When I started the Stress Reduction Clinic back in 1979, the classical dogma was that there were certain risk factors for disease uh, and some of those risk factors were smoking. Smoking, definite risk factor, lung disease, heart disease, and uh, uh, you know, so emphysema, heart disease, and of course cancer, okay? All three wrapped up in smoking. Then there's a high fat animal fat diet, not so good. These are risk factors. And then they would make, and others, uh, risk factors like uh, you know, sedentary lifestyle, uh, uh, high blood pressure. But then they would say, but stress is not our bona fide risk factor. Well, now they've shown, and, uh, and uh, Liz Blackburn won the Nobel Prize for this in 2008, that stress actually degrades the, the uh, tips of our chromosomes that are called telomeres. They're repeat subunits of DNA, DNA at the end of all of our chromosomes. And they're like those, those plastic things on the ends of our shoelaces. And every time a cell divides, a little bit of that gets broken off. And when the, the cell divides a certain number of times, that's it. They, they don't they know more. And stress accelerates the breaking off of those telomeres 
the breaking down of the telomeres. We call it the degrading of the telomeres. But there's an enzyme that can actually lengthen them again. And that enzyme is called telomerase. And Liz Blackburn won the Nobel Prize for it. And it turns out that stress accelerates the degradation and uh, learning how to deal with stress actually lengthens the telomeres. So that means that if you've ever said to yourself, my God, that experience has taken years off my life, it's actually literally true. I mean, and they calculated that with, under certain conditions, with the people they were studying who have very high stress uh, lives, uh, that um, it resulted in seven years worth of life being lost on the telomeres, on average. And, uh, but if you learn how to handle the stress, then actually you, you are uh, extending your own life. So these three new sciences are making it uh, incredibly uh, rich, uh, an incredibly rich time to actually uh, understand more about what's going on with meditation. And there's a huge amount of research that's actually, actually being done now on all of these kinds of things. I'm not going to talk so much about the results of that research tonight, uh, but I'm going to try to actually speak to you more personally. And I would also like to uh, have time for dialogue and as well to practice some together. Would that be all right with you if we actually practice some together so we know what we're talking about? Okay, because you can always like, you know, go online and find out all this information, but I feel like the time that we have together here is, is precious, and, uh, and I'd like to actually make the maximum use of it. Meanwhile, you please keep in mind what really, 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 really brought you here. <laughs> and we'll see by the end of the evening, or maybe by the end of the week, or by the end of the year, because these things are very alive, and it's not like just one night. I'm not here to entertain you, but in some way we might interact that would be uh, slightly changing, maybe in some tiny little way, your relationship to your own life, and your own body, and your own mind, and your own heart. And if that's the case, the tiniest little shifts, they turn out to not be so tiny. They get amplified in ways that are astonishing and remarkable. And that's what we see in the stress reduction clinic. When we invite people with chronic diseases, with chronic pain, with chronic medical conditions of all kinds, many different kinds of cancer, heart disease, you name it, we will see it in the stress reduction clinic. And as Andre said, it's not to cure them. We make a big distinction between curing and healing. And curing, they haven't been able to be cured by the healthcare system. Uh, but what we thought was, why not bring these meditative practices into the mainstream of medicine and see if people couldn't take more responsibility for being in wise relationship to their own minds and bodies and see what would happen. And what happens is that uh, their biology changes for, I think, many of the reasons I just pointed to and their relationship to their chronic pain changes. So we're not trying to fix them. We're not trying to take anything away from them. We're not trying to improve them because really we can't improve on perfection. And if what I'm saying about human beings are true, you're perfect actually the way you are. Now you probably argue immediately, wait a minute, he doesn't know who I am. He can't possibly mean me. He might mean everybody else in the room, but not me, but you're perfect as you are including all your imperfections. See, that's perfect too. And then the question is really, the challenge of mindfulness is, can we work with it? Can we work with things as they are? Can we be in wise relationship with things as they are? And one way to think about mindfulness is that it's all about relationality. It's all about relationships. And if you think about it a little deeper, how do we know anything? How are we in relationship with anything? Let's take the outs outer world because, quote unquote, outer world, because uh, how, how do you uh, know how to get home? You know, all of you, I'm not worried about any of you. When the evening is over, I am guessing that every single one of you will get home. If you had Alzheimer's, you wouldn't. 
Okay? If you were blind, it would be a huge challenge. If you, uh, so, so you see, we forget that the way we know things is, say, by seeing. Okay? That's one way that we know the world. If we couldn't see, that would be difficult. But the brain being very plastic, it develops other capacities, like hearing, to an extraordinary degree, so that you might be able to hear your way home by the streetcar and the sounds and so forth. So if we ask how do we know anything, is seeing, hearing, <coughs> smelling, tasting, touching, five senses. That's what we were all taught in school. But there are many more than five senses now, it turns out. As the, the neuroscience is showing, there's a sense of, like for instance, I know where my hand is right now. This hand, I cannot see this hand. But I know exactly where it is, and I know it's not here. And I know it's not here. I still can't see it, but, and I know that how many fingers I have up or down. How do I know that? It's a sense. It's not exactly touch. It's called proprioception. The brain does this. And it's remarkable, and it can also actually find the mouth and put something right in the mouth and not miss it. It takes a while for this to develop, and in babies, sometimes the food goes everywhere. But by the time we're two or something like that, at least, mostly it goes in the mouth. That's extraordinary. So if there's any way in which you think, so that's the sense called proprioception. Then you run into somebody outside in the street, and they say, you haven't seen them for a while, and they say, hi, how are you? And you say, fine. How do you know? How do you know that you're fine? <laughs> well, it could be you just don't want to say how you're really doing to that person, so you just say, fine. But how do you know how you're feeling at all? That's another sense. It's called interoception. It's a way that we have of basically reading the biology of the internal organs instantly. Instantly. Interoception. So how do we know anything? By being in touch. Now the Buddhists would say, we have to bring in a little ancient wisdom from the East, the Buddhists would say there is another sense that we ignore, and that is awareness itself. Without awareness, you can see and not see. Without awareness, things could be coming to your ears and you don't hear. Maybe you've had that experience. Somebody is telling you something, but you're so focused you don't hear it. But you know, or it's they're telling you something you don't want to hear. Geniuses are tuning it out. But maybe you're in a room with this many people and somebody at that upper corner mentions your name. Oh, they're speaking about me. And all of a sudden your hearing becomes very good. Why? Because like we're so ego invested. Ah, me. What could be a more interesting subject than that? I think I'll go and straighten them out on how important I am or how much they don't understand the story of me. I'll tell them my story of me. And sometimes we get very invested in the story of me. But the point is that awareness can actually be a way of sensing the world, and especially the inner world. So there's no inner and outer. There's simply all these capacities for touching the world and being touched by the world. In English, we say coming to our senses. It means to wake up. It doesn't just mean to feel, see, hear, taste, touch. Coming to our senses means wake up. So these are capacities that are inborn. They, we're born with them. There's nothing, you know, that we're already whole in that regard, but we have not had a lot of training in that. This is a university, this is a college. Uh, when you reflect on your education, probably you got taught a lot about thinking and you became a very, very, very good thinker, an analytical thinker, you know, sort of a, uh, able to discern different qualities and to talk endlessly about this and that, uh, make comparisons and so forth. So we've got tremendous training in thinking. But there's another element of our being that we get no education in that's obviously more powerful than thinking because it can take any thought and hold it, like a mother holds her child to any thought, especially terrifying thoughts, especially, you know, really disturbing thoughts, or really uh, frightening, whatever you want to call it. And that capacity is called awareness. But we never get any training in awareness at school. 
So let me say what mindfulness is. Uh, mindfulness, it, my working definition of it is that it's, the, it's awareness, okay? It's awareness, but it's the awareness that arises by paying attention on purpose in the present moment, non-judgmentally. And how do we pay attention? Through those senses. Seven, eight, nine, ten, whatever you want to say. But that's, we, we actually attend to our experience. And on the basis of that experience, we cultivate awareness, which is a form of knowing. But it's not just a conceptual knowing. It's not just a conceptual knowing. It's a knowing that uh, you don't have to think about how to get home when you go home tonight. It's in more intuitive. So, uh, now when teachers work in the classroom with children, in Norway, do you take attendance, it's called? You, you, you ask kids, are they, are they in the room? And they say present. They, you call out the names and they say present. Does that happen in Norway? Yeah, you take attendance, we call it. So that means, you know, the kids are present. They'll say, I'm present. But a lot of the time, if you investigate it, the kids aren't present. They're looking out the window. They're doing anything but paying attention. Sometimes, how many of you are teachers in the audience? Anybody a teacher? Don't you wish that your children would pay attention more in the classroom? Well, instead of yelling at them, which when I was a student, I mean, the teachers would yell at us in the New York City public high schools to pay attention, but that didn't work very well. But what if we taught them how to pay attention? What if we taught them how to tune in and actually aim the attention and then sustain the attention over time? That's the kind of exercise of a muscle. Why? Because it's very hard to pay attention. You've heard of attention deficit disorder, right? And attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. And these are very real problems that can drive parents crazy. But I also like to point out that from the meditative tradition's point of view, the entire society, and I'm talking about the US, I can't make any judgments about Norway having been here for 24 hours, but from the point of view of the U.S., the, from the perspective of the meditative traditions, the entire society has attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, <laughs> big time. And if you start to pay attention to it, the mind is all over the place. It's all over the place. That's the natural, what you could call, if you're into computers, the default state of the mind is to be here, there, <laughs> depending on what um, is most interesting. Now, do you... I see an iPhone on the desk. Will I mess it up if I just hold it? So now you see people walking through down the street. No one ever used to do this. There was this like this would have been considered like, you know, but now, you know, people are like not looking where they're going because they're staring into this. We're continually scanning the world for something more interesting than this. Oh, maybe somebody emailed me, or maybe somebody's texting me, or did I get some new piece of information? And we're so interested in what we might be missing that we're actually missing this moment. And if you think about it, if you stop and think about it for a moment, this moment is the only moment any of us ever have. That we're not alive tomorrow. We're alive now. We're not alive yesterday or three years from today in the past, or three years from today in the future. We're only alive now. But if we're continually distracting ourselves, then we're not actually in intimate connection with the only moment we're alive in. Just think for a moment what that does to the next moment. If you're really mindless, we could call that mindless, just completely out of touch and very much involved in thinking, but even D disruptive, discordant thinking, how's that going to shape the next moment? And especially if something surprising happens, but it catches you unawares, and let's say it's stressful, or let's say it's threatening, one might actually contract when the most important thing would be not to contract. For instance, there are people who come with a diagnosis of heart disease where they say, my doctor told me that the next time I get angry may be my last moment. 
So I've come here to learn how to, and I'm a very angry person. <laughs> Happens. We can't interview the people who die of sudden cardiac death, you know, and just say, what were you thinking just before you dropped dead? <laughs> But a lot of the time, I think if we could, what we would find is like some thought went through their mind. Some thought. Some tiny little nothing. Maybe it has to do with taxes. Or maybe it has to do with, you know, some bad feeling between two people that you care about. Or an insult that you received. Or what money worries. Or some tiny little thought. And the heart just goes into spasm of one kind or another coronary artery spasm, whatever it is, sudden cardiac death or electrical, dead. So what about learning how to regulate our anxiety? What, how about learning how to regulate our anger? How to, learning how to regulate our emotions and our thoughts so that we actually become friends with them. We're not trying to fix them. We're not trying to change them. We're not trying to make them go away. But we're learning how to put the welcome mat out for them and say, okay, I see this. Now, how can I be in relationship to it? Instead of getting caught up in it and going on autopilot, automatic pilot, where I just react the way I always react. Sometimes when people, you know, tense up, it, it creates back problems or it causes jaw problems or, you know, this, the list of stress-related disorders is enormous. And it all starts with thinking. And I just heard a talk by a woman named Alyssa Eppel, who's a researcher and clinical psychologist at the University of California in San Francisco, who works in Liz Blackburn's laboratory, the telomere laboratory and the telomerase laboratory. And she said that she is coming to realize that thinking, that stress is really a disease of thinking. And if that's so, what would the antidote be to a disease of thinking? It would be this. It's not fixing the thinking. It would not be cognitive therapy, which means changing one thought for a better thought. Because you may not know what the better thought is. You may think you know what the better thought is, but you may not actually know. In fact, there's now a whole science and a whole therapy called mindfulness-based cognitive therapy that's actually about not substituting one thought for another, but actually recognizing thoughts as they arrive in the moment and just seeing them as like clouds going through the sky. Even if they are thoughts that, you know, that generate depression, what's called depressive rumination. And when you learn how to actually befriend those thoughts and just let them come and go without trying to push them away, suppress them, or pursue them over and over and over again, which is what spirals you down into depressive, a depressive episode, then people don't relapse into depression. It turns out they have some degree, a huge degree of control over that kind of thing. And it's, it's astonishing for them when they discover that because many of these people have been suffering for 20, 30, 40 years and taking all sorts of drugs and the drugs are only helpful to a degree and sometimes a very small degree. And here we have this internal power lying inside us for self-regulation. And, and it all starts with attention. So, you know, if, how would you start to connect with yourself? Well, one way is I could call myself up. Let's see, I have this upside down. Dial my number and say, hello, John, are you present? Are you there? And like a kid in the class. And I say, yes, I'm present, when I'm really not. You know, uh, are you really in touch? Are you present? But we don't need the iPhone to do that. We have a much more, you might think this is fantastic technology, by the way. It's like awesome technology, and it is, and I have one. <laughs> Which I try to regulate, you know, the use of. But, um, but that's, this is nothing compared to this. You have the most complex, sophisticated, uh, gathering, I don't know exactly what word to use, like, uh, organization of matter in the known universe, right inside your skin. Over a hundred, let's see, the number is sort of fluid, but uh, maybe a hundred billion cells 
neurons in the brain itself, then you have at least as many glial cells, 100 billion. So let's say rough and roughly, let's say a trillion cells in this body, all came out of one cell. And you thinking you're not a walking miracle? I mean, there's something wrong with that kind of thinking. I mean, this is extraordinary. And how much time do you have on the planet? No time at all. You only have now. So you check your watch. Where's my watch? Oh my God, it's now, again. <laughs> how does this happen? How does this happen? It's now, again. So how are we going to be in relationship to now? How are we going to be in relationship to our body? Okay. And it's funny to even say, I'm in relationship with my body. What do you mean? It's like you own the body? I have a body, we say, but that's a little strange, isn't it? I have a body. Who's speaking? But how are we to be in relationship to the body? Uh, to the breath? For instance, I mean, we, we, when, when we think about, well, if we're going to pay attention, what are we going to pay attention to? We're going to pay attention to objects, to things that we can pay attention to, or processes that we can pay attention to, parts of our experience. So what is one convenient thing that we can pay attention to? The Buddha said it very clearly. It's called the first foundation of mindfulness. And by the way, mindfulness is usually spoken of as the heart of Buddhist meditation. So it's actually a very, very radical thing to attempt to bring Buddhist meditation without the Buddhism into mainstream medicine and healthcare and then the larger society. Okay? But it really has to do with attention and there's nothing Buddhist about attention. There's nothing particularly Eastern. There's nothing particularly magic, mysterious about it. And attention is in intimate relationship with intention, with doing it on purpose rather than just some loud noise goes off and it catches your attention for a moment. But what if, you know, you intend to actually be present? So this no longer is in the realm of technique. Meditation is not a technique. Mindfulness is certainly not a technique. It's a way of being. And so it's the awareness that arises by paying attention on purpose in the present moment, which we've now established is the only moment we ever have to be alive in. And then Oh, one last thing, non-judgmentally. Now, when you start to pay attention to your mind, it doesn't take you more than a few seconds to realize that we have ideas and opinions and judgments about just about everything. We like some people, we don't like other people, we like this experience, we don't like that experience. I mean, we're just like a jumble of judgments constantly. And this is saying, can we actually suspend judgment? So it doesn't mean, mindfulness doesn't mean that you won't be judgmental. Mindfulness really means that you'll become more aware of how judgmental you are. And then th that gives us the possibility of actually not believing all those judgments. And then that opens up enormous dimensions of freedom. If you don't believe your own propaganda, <laughs> then actually, you know, there's a lot of space for being in wiser relationship to other people, to nature, to your own body, to your own thoughts, to your own emotions. Do you hear what I'm saying? And this is something where it's no longer a technique, it's a way of being. It's a way of being alive. It's a way of being awake. It's a way of being in wiser, welcome, wise relationship to, uh, you didn't miss anything. Uh, <clears throat> true, I mean, you really didn't miss anything. Because what we're talking about is not a doing. It's a non, it's what, you know, the Chinese might call or the Zen people might call non-doing. It's about being. And yet we're so busy doing, doing, doing all the time. And thinking is a big part of the doing. And judging is a big part of the doing. That there's very little time to just drop into being. And then let the doing, because I'm not advocating not doing anything. I'm not advocating laziness or I'm not advocating just getting stupid. By the way, non-judgmental doesn't mean stupid. Well, if I give up my judgments, then I might walk in front of a trolley car. I'm crossing the street and I just like, 
I'm being non-judgmental, so I just like don't make any decisions. No, it's not like you're not making decisions. It's that there's a difference between judging, which is kind of a very, very rapid black or white, like, don't like, this is good, that's bad kind of assessment, which is like a hair trigger. It's so habitual that it actually is imprisoning. But instead, what we're cultivating is a quality that we all have called discernment, being able to see shades between black and white, being able to see shades of subtlety in relationships, not getting caught in our own propaganda or our own you know, sort of storyline about what we like, what we don't like, who we are, whether we're smart, whether we're not, whether we're too thin, whether we're too you know, large, whatever it is, we've got all these ideas and opinions that prevent us from actually being who we actually are. So who we actually are is much bigger than we think we are. And mindfulness is what is often spoken of as a liberative practice. It liberates us from the small-mindedness that we are in so much a habit of getting caught in. It's almost like a prison, but we forget about that. And then when we're not in the now, when we're not present, where are we? You start to pay attention to what's on your mind. A lot of the, and this is why it's so hard to practice mindfulness. You sit down to practice, let me just, and we're going to do some in a minute. <coughs> sit down and say, okay, I think I will now, I don't know, you choose some object to pay attention to. So the most convenient one is the breath, or your body in some way. The Buddha said the body is the first foundation of mindfulness, and the first thing he mentioned was breathing. So you start to pay attention to your breath. And why don't we do that? You don't even have to sit up straight or do anything special, but see if you can just bring awareness to your body breathing. And you'll notice you don't even have to close your eyes. Can you feel your body breathing? That's a sense, that's proprioception, okay? You can actually feel the body breathing. And noticing that you don't have to now take charge of the breath. Oh, now we're paying attention to breathe. I think I'll, reg I'll maybe I'm breathing a little shallowly. Oh, judging, okay. I think I need to breathe more deeply, another judgment. So then you start, and I need to be in control, so I'll start controlling my breath. No, just, the body breathes perfectly well without your getting involved. In fact, you, you know, it's silly to call it my breathing. Because if it was up to you to breathe, you would have died a long time ago. You know, whoops, got distracted, forgot, dead, dead. So let's just feel the breath. But let's not Let's not make the breath special. Of course, it's very special because one breath, if you don't take the next breath, we're dead. So it's very, very, very special, and we should never ignore that or take it for granted. But there's something else that's also special going on. Let's feel the breath. It's the ability to feel the breath. Can you bring awareness to that awareness? Can you bring awareness to the awareness of breathing? And can you rest in the awareness? Moment by moment by moment. Another way to put it, because words are, get really difficult at this point, another way to put it would be, can you be the knowing of breathing? And of course, the answer is, of course you can, but you've probably never done it before or never thought about that. <clears throat> and then it's not about thinking, so it's like use the thought to actually just feel the breath and be the knowing of the feeling of the breathing. It's not thinking about the breath. And let's just settle into this moment and ride as if you were a surfer. I see some young people in the audience, so I don't know if you surf or not, but you can imagine, you know, you're on a surfboard and you're riding on the waves of your own breathing. And you're feeling just the way if you were a surfer, you would feel it in your whole body and make 
slight adjustments. You don't have to make any adjustments, but the awareness of what the body is doing. It's a miracle that we just breathe in, breathe out, and it takes care of itself. And it feeds. Every breath feeds every one of those trillion cells in the universe of you, whether they're bone cells, or whether they're muscle cells, or whether they're heart cells, or liver cells, or brain cells. So just right, never mind, you don't have to think about any of that, you just feel the breath. Rising and falling. And can you be the knowing that awareness already is? In this case, the knowing of breathing. And by knowing, I don't mean thinking, I mean feeling, sensing. Okay, so if we had lots of time, or we had a whole day together, as I'm going to be with some people tomorrow for a whole day, and then the next day too, but if you went to an MBSR program, for instance, and there are MBSR teachers here in Oslo, and you can find them, um, and I'll talk about that, we'll talk about that at the end. We'd extend this out for maybe 20 minutes, maybe an hour. And after a while, the mind would just say, I've had enough of this stupidity. I don't want one more, one more breath I'm going to scream. <laughs> because, because another mind state will arise, and that mind state is called boredom. Do you know any boredom? Have you ever had experience with boredom? Boredom is a very, very interesting mind state. And as soon as we get simple and quiet, boredom comes up. We crave entertainment. We're all addic addicts. We're all drug addicts. We want to be, we're addicted to distraction. We're addicted to self-distraction. When you bring awareness to that addiction, then you can modulate it, you can regulate it, you can dance with it in different ways. So, just raise your hands if you had any kind of experience that, that felt like you, you could actually be aware of the awareness of breathing. Raise your hands if you could do that, just if you found that you could do it. Raise your hands, anybody. Raise them up high so I can feel it. Okay, that looks like most people in the room. And probably even if you're not raising your hand, you did, but it's so unfamiliar that you say, I don't even know what he's talking about. I can feel my breath, yes, but well, that's it. But how can you feel it? Well, it has to be with awareness, otherwise you wouldn't feel it. But we're, it's such foreign territory and it's so, f it's not thought. There's nothing wrong with thought, by the way. I'm not, I'm not criticizing thinking. It's a beautiful capacity. But there's this equally beautiful capacity we call awareness. And if we don't cultivate that, then our thoughts tend to go crazy. And sometimes they can be very self-destructive and extremely stressful. And as I was pointing out, actually shorten your lifespan and certainly affect the quality of your life and the quality of your relationships including how you choose to be from moment to moment in relationship to even simple things like taking care of your body, like diet and exercise and intimate relations. The most intimate relation, of course, is you with yourself. And you don't need the cell phone to actually get in touch. Hello? No, you don't need that. So now let's, let's play with one more piece of this, okay? So we were following the breath, that's an object of attention. Here's a rule of thumb around mindfulness, and, and it's something that may save, you, uh, may, may save you a lot of a certain kind of wrong effort. When we focus on the breath, it's never about the breath. It's about the awareness. If we were, say, focusing on hearing, for instance, on the sense of hearing, now, if we were outside in nature, we'd probably think it was much more interesting to focus on hearing than in here, especially if I stop talking. But actually, can you hear the sound of silence? And 
And of course, there's lots of sounds available. And then we might judge them, and we might name them, but I'm not talking about judging or naming, just hearing what's here. That's another capacity, and being aware of it. Otherwise, these sounds have been going on all the time we've been in the room, but we tune them out. So then you could do, uh, so we did the sense of seeing, we could do the sense of hearing, we could do the sense of, oh, and the breathing. Well, we could do it with seeing, we didn't do seeing, but you could pick out some object and just gaze on it. A beautiful object is a baby. I don't know if the baby's still in the room. Is the baby still in the room? Yeah, okay. So to gaze on, how many of you have small children? Yeah. If you get too busy, you might not see them for three or four years. <laughs> it's very important to actually, every once in a while, without making a big deal of it or something special, just gaze on your children, or on a flower, or on the clouds moving through the sky, or whatever it is. So seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, touching, or this awareness. So let's do the last one. Just let's, let's actually be, uh, aware without choosing any object at all. Instead of saying, okay, I'm going to focus on my breath, let's just not, let's just have the awareness be as big as the sky. The sky can hold clouds, it can hold the moon and the sun and the day and the night. Please, bye-bye. Watch the book on the way out. Yeah, thank you. So let's let the mind be so spacious that there's no center to it and no periphery to the awareness. And we just sit here. No agenda. No striving. And whatever arises in the field of awareness it comes and goes like clouds, or like day and night, or like birds moving through the sky. Sounds, thoughts, emotions. Just letting them come and go. And if you like, you can imagine that you're actually a mountain, that your body is like a mountain sitting. And everything that's occurring in the field of awareness is like the weather. Just storms or a gentle breeze or day or night or whatever it is. It's just the weather and the seasons unfolding. And all there is is awareness. And if you like, if it's more vivid, if you close your eyes, you're welcome to do that. But sometimes that itself becomes really distracting. And just letting it all unfold in awareness. Almost like an empty mirror reflecting whatever comes before it. But instead of a mirror, it's, it's like a field of awareness. Boundless limitless field of awareness, which is what awareness really is. So then nothing is a distraction, it's just this. Just this. We don't even name it. Or we notice that we do name it so quickly. Oh, baby crying. Uh, then we notice, oh, that's just words. Not the sound itself. <coughs> So just resting in awareness without any objects. With a choiceless awareness so that whatever comes into the field of awareness, that's known, met and known. And we don't push anything away and we don't pursue anything. Or if we do pursue something or push something away, then we notice that and we always come back to now.
So now noticing the quality of your uh, awareness right in this moment. Is it in fact spacious and just allowing everything and anything to unfold in your experience in awareness? Or have you gotten distracted and carried off uh, someplace else in, in, by the thought stream? And if so, then can you simply reestablish yourself in awareness? You can always use the breath as an anchor for your attention, and then expand it to include sounds and all the other senses and thoughts and emotions and awareness itself. Each time the mind wanders, we can always notice what's on our minds and then make a choice as to how we will rest in awareness in relationship to what's unfolding. <coughs> and now, if you care to, allowing your eyes to open, <coughs> and maintaining a seamless continuity of awareness even as you allow your eyes to open if they've been closed. So you'll notice that you can be aware of the body sitting here, breathing, aware of any thoughts that might be moving through your mind, aware of any emotions, and aware of being in a room with a lot of other people. And so in that sense, the real meditation practice extends out into life itself. When this talk is over and you go home, this same awareness can just go with you. It's completely portable. It's completely portable. You get on the tram or you get in your car or whatever, and, and you can be in the present <coughs> moment with less reactivity, with less judgment, and uh, <coughs> a greater spaciousness. In other words, you can rest in awareness and not be so lost in thought. If the mind goes off, you can always see what's on your mind and bring it back. And bring it back lovingly, with kindness. In all Asian languages, the word for mind and the word for heart are the same word. So if you're hearing the word mindfulness in English, and you don't also hear the word heartfulness, you're not really understanding it. It's not some cold clinical orientation to sort of distance yourself. It's an embrace of awareness of whatever your experience is, as if it really mattered, and ultimately as if this moment, which is your life, really mattered. And when you begin to shift your default mode from one of mindlessness and constant, what one Microsoft researcher named Linda Stone called continuous partial attention, and she said that's our default mode. We live continually in continuous partial attention. That means we're never fully present for anything. And what if we were able to, and this is what I think mindfulness actually does when we cultivate it, when we practice it, when we exercise the muscle, slowly something starts to grow. And it's a lot more interesting than a bicep. But what we're doing is we're actually shifting from a default mode of mindlessness to a default mode of mindfulness, in other words, of, of presence and of being a certain kind of, in, this is a certain kind of intelligence that allows us to actually navigate and regulate the ups and downs, the stress and the pain and whatever it is that we deal with in life and the dis, disorders and diseases and aging and challenges and whatever it is, in ways that really have integrity, and where we actually can maintain or regain our balance, inwardly as well as outwardly, moment by moment by moment, in ways that are profoundly satisfying. And that now all the science that I just briefly mentioned at the beginning is showing really transforms us on a biological level, 
and on a psychological level, and on a heart level, or what you might call a spiritual level, whatever the words are that you want to speak, that's not what's most important. What's most important is the embodied experience of living your life, your life, not somebody else's life, as if it was beautiful, and if it, as if it really mattered. And no one can give you that. No one can give you that. No amount of material wealth or possessions or even good relationships with other people can, can by itself influence your relationship with yourself. We, we, I think, are in need of learning how to befriend ourselves. To befriend ourselves. And it, I want to open it up now to questions and to dialogue, but before I do, I think I'll share a poem with you. This is always risky to do in a foreign country, you know, because the po poems are hard enough in your own language. But I've, I've spent enough time in Scandinavia, not just in Norway, to know that most of you speak English better than I do <laughs> and understand it in a way that's just really powerful. So I'm going to share a poem with you uh, that has to do with this sense of befriending yourself, of reconnecting with who you actually are and whatever it means to you. Just drink it in, just let the sounds come in through your skin and through your bones and through your ears. And if they make sense, great. And if it doesn't make sense, well, lots of poetry is, you know, doesn't make sense. This is by a poet named Derek Walcott, who actually won the Nobel Prize in literature some years ago. <clears throat> He's from the island of St. Lucia in the Caribbean. And he writes very, very long poems. This may be his only short poem, I don't know. Uh, and it's called Love After Love. And speaking of love, let, let me just say, before I sh say the poem, that I've come to actually recognize that the practice of being present in our lives is actually an act of love. It's a, it's a radical act of love to drop in on the present moment. It's also a radical act of sanity, because if you're not in the present moment, where are you? And if you have to use your th capacity for thinking, but you're not in the present moment, and you're lost someplace, you may not be able to utilize all of your intelligences. And the same with emotions and the same with all of the body intelligence that we have. So this is not a luxury. It's like, oh, well, you know, I have everything else together in my life, now I'll meditate. This is a radical act of love, of, of sanity, of kindness towards oneself. And this, this sort of formal, we didn't have time to talk about all the different doors into the practice of mindfulness, there are a lot of formal meditation practices, but this is not what it's really about. That doesn't mean it's not a very, very good idea to do it. And we practice and train in formal meditation a lot. But uh, it does mean that this is not the real meditation practice. The real meditation practice is how you live your life from moment to moment. So here is the poem. Just listen as best you can. The time will come when with elation, which means great happiness, the time will come when with elation you will greet yourself arriving at your own door, in your own mirror, and each will smile at the other's welcome and say, sit here, eat. You will love again, you will love again the stranger who was yourself. You will love again the stranger who was yourself. Give wine, give bread, give back your heart to yourself, to the stranger who has loved you all your life, who you have ignored for another, who knows you by heart. Take down the love letters from the bookshelf, the photographs, the desperate notes, Peel your own image from the mirror. Sit. Feast on your life. Feast on your life. 
Feast means a gigantic, wonderful, happy meal. So feast on your life. So before we go to questions, I just want to ask, uh, Michael, do you want to get up? I want to inter, you know, just introduce Michael uh, Devib. Is that how you pronounce it? That's fine. And just say, uh, <laughs> I guess it wasn't fine. <laughs> Uh, who is the head of the Norwegian uh, Society for Mindfulness in Education, Healthcare, and Research? And to just that, just to know that there is such an organization, and just say one or two words about it. You know, maybe the website. Yes. Uh, last year, one year ago, we created uh, this organization, and uh, we're now 400 members uh, with uh, professionals uh, that work with mindfulness in their own life and uh, in their uh, capacity, uh, in the capacity they work in. Uh, and we have uh, people on the board. Please, if you get up. Uh, I, I, I have the chance to uh, present them. And okay. Eben and uh, Matthias. Um, and one, Bergliot uh, Jelsvik, uh, she's in London doing, uh, no, in Exeter, doing an MBCT master's degree. And we are the board, and uh, I will put a little flyer here uh, okay. uh, with information on the organization. And uh, our intention is to promote mindfulness in Norway and uh, create networks and also uh, arrange courses. So. Wonderful. Well, thank you very much. <laughs> uh, the, reason, the reason I did that is because I, I, I want you to know that if anything that I've said, uh, and you probably got the idea that I could go on for another three or four hours. I mean, it's no problem at all. Uh, but if there's anything that got said this evening, that um, is of interest to you, that there actually is a growing movement in Norway to do this kind of work, that is doing this kind of work. Andres, as you heard, is one of the you know, pioneers, if not the pioneer in Norway, doing, doing this kind of work. And there are many different doors into the room, so it doesn't all have to be MBSR. There are a lot of different ways to cultivate mindfulness. It's never been about the MBSR, it's about the M. Okay? And the M is very, 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 very deep. Uh, it's not called the heart of Buddhist meditation for nothing. But as you recall, I said the Buddha wasn't a Buddhist. And uh, so it's not about Buddhism, it's about being human and recognizing these deep capacities that we all have. So what I'd like to do now in the time remaining before 7.30, we have about 15 minutes, maybe a little more, uh, to just... Uh, and we'll pass the microphone around. If anybody has any questions that arose from anything that I said or didn't say, uh, you're welcome to voice them, or if you have any comments, and I will try to respond if I can to any, to any of that. And what I would ask of all of you is if you could stay until 7.30, so that you know when someone gets up and asks a question, half the group doesn't walk out, which is kind of doesn't feel good to the people who are talking. Uh, it won't be long, it'll actually be more like 10 minutes because uh, we've only got 10 minutes to go. And then try to be mindful of what they're saying and be mindful of how you might be judging what they're saying. Okay? No question is a stupid question. No comment is a stupid question. Comment, but the mind might say, oh, why is she asking that? It would be so much better if she asked something else. Mm, just watch the mind do that. <laughs> and see if you can allow the heart to be a little bit bigger and a little bit more generous and to listen very, very deeply to what's actually being asked, what's really, 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 really being asked by the question. And please, because we have not that much time, don't start with when your father and mother met. Uh, try to make it really precise. Anybody have a comment or a question? Or a, a, yes, okay. Hi, um, I'm a translator and I'm planning to translate a book on mindfulness into Norwegian. 
Uh, so I was very interested that you started off by acknowledging the difference between talking about something in your own language and a foreign language. Um, and it's very common when people talk about mindfulness in Norwegian to use the English word, mindfulness. Yeah. Um, I was wondering if you had any thoughts about the advantages and disadvantages of using the English word as opposed to kind of native Norwegian. I do. I, actually, I do have some thoughts. And, and I'm sure that a lot of other people in the, you can hold on to it for now, also have thoughts about that, I know, because we've been talking about that with Andres Kurze and, and uh, Ilvin. Uh, I think <coughs> that unless there's a really fabulous word in Norwegian for mindfulness, that it's better to use the English word. Uh, because um, it's, it's a very subtle um, communication. And mindfulness is not a concept. It's a, as I was suggesting, it's a way of being and it's a kind of embodied way of being. So when you're trying to bring something that's perhaps very new and transformative into a new culture, it's, it may be helpful to actually give it a, a, a word that people don't know so that, that you can b build a kind of deep understanding about it. Uh, and so, um, for instance, in French, there's no word for mindfulness, and they have to put five or six words together to make a word for mindfulness. They call it attention de la pleine conscience. And, and the same thing is true in, um, in Spanish, that there's no word for mindfulness. In Italian, there's a very beautiful word for mindfulness, consapevolezza. So, but there's a bigger problem. It's not just translating the word mindfulness. In order to translate anything that has to do with mindfulness, you have to live it from the inside. Otherwise, you can get all the words right and miss the meaning completely. And it's got level after level after level of subtlety. So I'm hoping that you actually have your own mindfulness practice and meditation practice because when you read, let's say you're translating from English into Norwegian, so you read something that has a certain kind of meaning intonation, it's using words to try to touch something in people that goes beyond words. You can't just take the words and translate them and hope for that. It's like translating poetry. You have to understand what the intention is. And someone who doesn't practice mindfulness, and, and, and if it's a book about MBSR, understand MBSR from the inside, there's no possible way that they can do that and come out with a good translation that will have that effect on the reader. So uh, thank you for asking that question. We could talk about that for an hour because it's very, very interesting how you use words to go into the heart beyond words. And, uh, and skillful translators are, you know, really um, do that with great artistry. So thank you. Is that a satisfying enough answer for now? Given yes. Okay. Now, was there another hand right here? Yeah. Uh, I'm uh, very fascinated by this uh, word acceptance. Mm. And you're, you're speaking earlier about uh, people coming to your clinic and really accepting that they are good as they are, that I'm good as I am. And uh, having practiced mindfulness... I wouldn't say good, but okay. Yeah. <laughs> you're as okay, you're okay, you're whole was the word yeah. I used. You're whole as you are. You're complete as you are. Yeah, that, because that make, introduces a nuance, because at least so far, I tend to think that when I look with mindfulness from now, backwards, I accept it. This is how I have come to be. Yes. And into, into towards the future, there is an intention direction where I intend to become even more mindful of not asking too long questions, for instance. <laughs> yeah. So, Very can you nice. say something about the, uh, in a sense, to nuance a bit, that radical acceptance? Well, uh, the, the only thing that I can really say about it, and thank you for that question, it's very beautiful, is that um, what acceptance really means is recognizing how things actually are in relationship to, well, you could say everything else, but at least in relationship to what's most important. Now, to not accept that or to not see it is just uh, unconscious. And a lot of the time we're really unconscious. But acceptance doesn't mean for somebody who say has uh, you know, a serious medical problem with a lot of pain, 
that you have to accept your pain. Do you know what I'm saying? People may not want to accept their pain and nobody's saying you must accept your pain. That's just going to make more pain. I mean, it's, you know, and more aggravation. But what acceptance really means is, um, is recognizing that this is how it is now. Okay? And finding some way to be in wise relationship to it, to not struggle with it. But it doesn't mean becoming a passive victim. It doesn't mean passive resignation. I surrender to my pain. But it means, no, but can I be in some kind of relationship with the pain? Most of the time, if you're in a lot of pain, the impulse is to go like this, turn away. Turn away, block it out, whatever is required. So people don't think, especially if you are a chronic pain condition, to actually turn towards it, to actually put out the welcome mat and say, okay, as long as you're here, let's have a conversation. Let's feel each other, so to speak. Let's see about how the relationship might be. And when you start to do that, I mean, this was extraordinary for me to see in chronic pain patients, that they all of a sudden found that there was room to be in relationship with experience that before all they wanted to do was run away, cut it out, or shut down completely or kill themselves. And now all of a sudden there's room. As soon as there's room, that's acceptance. Okay? And then will it grow over time? Who knows? But we'll take it moment by moment and as a rule it does tend to grow over time. But you can't tell someone else to accept anything. You know, it's like we have to come to that ourselves. Uh, and so the practice actually in very, in increasingly subtle ways and the languaging of the practice actually makes that something of an adventure. And then people are willing to do things that ordinarily they would never be willing to, or look at things that ordinarily they wouldn't want to pay attention to. And that is the, I said that there, I made a distinction between curing and healing. So curing is to make it the way it used to be. That's usually not possible. There are very few cures in medicine. Healing, in my terminology, is a coming to terms with things as they are. Coming to terms is another way of, in English, saying acceptance, but it's more rich. So it's a coming to terms. It's like a little bit of a negotiation. You know, I didn't want it to be this way. I didn't sign up for my life to be like this, but it is like this. So how can I find a way to be in wiser and more kind to myself, loving relationship to this moment? And when you do that, things change. And doctors are often astonished by how much people will change in eight weeks of MBSR. And I can remember many doctors saying to me, you, saying to uh, the patients who would then tell me, you changed more in eight weeks in MBSR than you changed in eight years of treatment with me. And they don't understand how is that possible? Well, it's possible because their patients are miraculous beings. They're a hundred trillion cells worth of, you know, the most organized matter in the known universe. And just to say, when people start to practice, two papers came out just this year by Britta Hützel, who's originally from Germany and is working now in the United States at the Mass General Hospital, showing that <clears throat> as I said, I mean, but the hippocampus and, the, the, and all sorts of regions in the, in the cortex actually change thickness uh, with MBSR and the amygdala, which is the sort of fear center of the limbic system, it actually gets thinner in eight weeks. So that's really quite extraordinary. And part of it is accepting things as they are. Thank you. We have time for one more. Okay, I'll take it around to you. I'm just going right by the camera. Okay. John, my question is, uh, how do you regard the spiritual dimension being present in your work with mindfulness? Mm. Oh, can I ask you a question in return? Sure. Okay, what do you mean by the word spiritual? Spiritual, for me, being a Buddhist practitioner, having that uh, blessing for 10 years, is within Buddhism, but that's more open definition that that dimension is, for me, much regarded with 
mindfulness. But I'll, yeah. I was curious to hear from you. Yeah. Well, I don't think it's avoidable. I mean, if you see uh, the look on a child's face and you really see it, would you call that a spiritual experience or n not? Miracle unfolding. Okay, so miracle unfolding, you're willing to call that a spiritual experience, okay. What about a flower? What about hearing a bird? You see where I'm going. What about giving birth to that baby? Uh, either all experience is potentially that rich, that miraculous, or no experience can be. I try to avoid the word spiritual because people have different ideas about spiritual, different sort of ideologies around spiritual, and my spiritual is more spiritual than your spiritual uh, in a certain way, and my meditation practice or my lama is better than your lama, and you know, it can go on endlessly. So what, what I try to do is emphasize the authenticity of the experience, and then when people want to put a name on it, like spiritual, fine, but what we're talking about is the full dimensionality of being human, and so my definition of spiritual, and I, I try not to use the word spiritual, is what it means, whatever it means, to be really human. And of course, you use the word dimension. So yes, there are lots of dimensions to our experience. And when we include all of them, they're here in every moment. There's never a moment in my experience that's not potentially rich in that kind of dimensionality if you are paying attention. If you're not paying attention, then it's just one more philosophy, one more propaganda around spiritual. And uh, it creates differences and barriers between people instead of that kind of direct connection, in my view. Also, when you're working in medicine, in the mainstream of medicine, and 30 years ago or more, trying to bring these kinds of esoteric, Buddhist, foreign practices into the mainstream of molecular and uh, modern medicine, uh, to talk about spirituality is not even wise, because then people will roll their eyeballs and think you're some kind of lunatic. Um, whereas if you talk about attention and awareness and compassion, those are the foundations of me medicine, those are foundations of science. And then insight, another foundation of science, and then, you know, science itself is profoundly spiritual. When you have an insight into the nature of reality or the world, it's like, you know, Einstein called it a cosmic religious experience. So the answer to your question is yes. <laughs> Do you want to hear one more, take one more question, shall we? Are we okay with this? Or I don't want to stretch it out, but I can feel a certain energy in the room. And I don't want to, like, we can't stretch it out forever, but if there's another question that would like to ask itself. <laughs> yes, okay. Hold on one second. And then, did you raise your hand? Who said that? Elaine first. Okay, no, of course, but were you the one that spoke up? Okay, so you'll be the last one. We'll have, we'll have five instead of three. I have a very simple question. Yes. Is there any such thing as an interrelational mindfulness? We've been talking about only individual experience. And I was looking at the mother and the baby, and you mentioned it earlier. Yeah. And that's very fundamental. It's process. all interrelational. And, yes. And yeah. you, you said that, but we, I work with children and families. Yeah. Children and uh, serious problems in their families. Yeah. And I'm also thinking about the cultural aspects that sometimes also determine what acceptance is, mm -hmm. what non-acceptance is, what norms are, what values are. And I would have loved to hear you say something about some of these issues. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for a wonderful presentation. Thank you. Well, first of all, thank you for asking that question. And this is one of the problems with a a brief presentation, and I would say, you know, so I have to start with the sort of foundation, which is, as I said, it's all relationship, but our relationship to our own experience. But our own experience doesn't end with the skin, it's out there, and so we all are, we came out of, I, 
We came out of the bodies of women, all of us, every single one of us. We all have family stories of one kind or another. We all have things happen to us. We're all facing stress and pain and illness and what I, you know, Zorba the Greek called the full catastrophe of life, the full <laughs> catastrophe of the human condition. And the question is how to be in wise relationship to it. So mindfulness can be brought to human relations in a very profound way and has to be. And that's so much a part of our practice and so much what we do in MBSR that it can seem like, oh, he's just talking about himself or our individual selves. But I'm not. What I'm talking about is recognizing how deeply interrelated we are. And then in terms of the kind of norms and conditioning that goes on in families and what we can accept and what we tell ourselves we can't accept or all of those kinds of issues, yes, those can be embraced in awareness as well. And there are methods that have been developed, if you want to pursue them, that are specialized in that kind of thing, one of which is called inside dialogue. So you could Google that if you wanted to. But it's not really uh, necessary because the practice of mindfulness itself does that. And what I was trying to do in this talk this evening was just give you like the, the, a little bit of a taste of how one would connect with this kind of domain, and then your heart and your relationships, and if you don't mind my putting it this way, your love will take care of the rest in profound ways. And then you'll find that there'll be lots of resources available once you sort of start looking, lots of different kinds of resources available for, <clears throat> say, dealing with parents who are under very stressful conditions or who are dealing with, you know, children, say, on the with ADHD or on the autism spectrum or whatever it is. There are many different things that are now being developed to uh, actually work with relationships in those kinds of ways, family ways, and so forth. Okay, so thank you for that. Thank you, my name is Robin Warner. You had a wonderful, you had many, many nice statements. And one of them is as follows. Mindfulness is not a technique, it is a way of being. In my world, it, uh, life is a lot about personal development. To live a worthwhile life. Uh, it's a, something to do with living a worthwhile life, meaningful life. Yes. Personal development is part of that. Could you please link mindfulness to the topic of uh, inner, uh, inner dialogue within oneself? You know, I believe in people's development through inner dialogue. Self-talk. Self-talk, yeah. Right. And if you can link that up to the mindfulness. Oh, yeah. Okay. I can, I can do it shorthand. I, it won't take... Uh, I, I, could, I could also talk for a long time about that. But... Uh, That's up to you. No, but it's also up to everybody else in the circumstances. So, one thing is... Uh, do you know what he means by inner dialogue? When you start to pay attention to what's going on in your mind. I mean, it's like an endless conversation with yourself. Only sometimes it's not a dialogue. It's, a, it's, it's like, you know, you got a thousand people in there all competing for attention and for, you know, this or that. Uh, lots of different kinds of internal, interior voices. And they are sometimes in opposition. Uh, and there's tension there because, should I go here or should I go there? Do you know how many people almost came to this talk tonight? <laughs> So when we bring awareness to the present moment, when we bring awareness to the present moment, we actually uh, recognize that there's a lot of time this interior push and pull and conversations and commentary and I like this and I don't like that and it's almost like uh, if you're watching a football game and the, with the sound off, all of a sudden you can see the football game because the commentators are just talking endlessly about what's going on in the game. But you're listening to them, you're not actually in the game. When you shut off the sound, then you're actually watching the game. So it's the same with the mind. It's this endless stream. And I use the word propaganda several times in the talk. It's not that it's unhealthy to have a narrative. And of course, we need to have narratives, who we are and where we're going. But then it's a big mistake to actually believe it. Because usually our narrative is too small compared to who we really are. And that was what I was trying to point at. And that's what the poem is saying, that you will love again the stranger who was yourself, the one you pushed away, so to speak, and never connected with. And then you can reclaim that relationship 
Well, it's here now all the time, in the body, in the breath, in the heart, in the mind, and in the wider world. So, just to say one more thing, and that is that people trained in MBSR at the University of Toronto, a paper published in 2007, uh, was shown that if you, uh, that there's a certain region of the brain in the midline of the cortex, the frontal cortex, that's called the default mode. And it is, uh, it is what they think is firing, what's going on when you're not doing anything. You, you put people in the scanner and you say, don't do anything. Don't do anything. And then this network lights up. And it's the network of self-distraction and endless conversation with oneself. And it's called the default mode. Another word for it is called the narrative network. It's like narration, okay? And it's endless. Now, when you're trained in MBSR, that network still happens. I mean, it's not like you stop thinking about yourself. But another network lights up, which is more lateral. And that is called the direct experience network. And so when you're, having, when you're able to actually be in your body with your breath in the present moment and not go into the story of me and where I'm going and everything else, this other network lights up. Now, when you are depressed, seriously depressed, you fall into this narrative network and it just goes forever and it takes you down. So the more you actually learn to live in the experiential, direct experience network, the less that narrative network is going to actually produce depressive relapse. And, and also that's also true for anxiety or many other kinds of conditions. So when we bring awareness to the narrative, then it's not like the narrative's bad and it's better to just be in your body in a non-narrative way, but the more you can bring these things together and not believe the narrative so much, then the narrative itself starts to grow. I am not who I think I am. I am not my name. I am not my age. I am not my ideas and opinions. And you begin to just question things. And then that itself is transformative, healing, and liberating. And this is something that, you know, is a lifetime's work. Meditation practice is not like eight weeks and then, okay, great, got it. It's like, it's like, it's a lifetime's work. It's like, uh, and, and I would say also, it's the adventure of a lifetime. So to just close, I'd like to say thank you to all of you for coming tonight. You've wasted a perfectly good evening that you could have filled with all sorts of things like shopping or eating or I don't know what. Uh, I'd also like to thank the younger people in the room. I see you over there. Thank you for your attention. Wow, that's not easy to do. Uh, thank you for coming. Uh, I hope that something that I said might have like been of interest to you. Uh, smallest one in the room, choking at the moment, you know. But, but thank you for coming too. And thank you, Mama, for coming. And so just a deep thank you uh, to all of you for your attention and for the energy that, that I can actually feel. And I hope that if anything that I have said drops into your heart and resonates with why you really, 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 really came here in the first place, <laughs> that you will pay some attention to that and then nurture it in ways that might be uh, uh, of service in this ongoing adventure we call life. So thank you very much. <laughs>